Hello, this is Talking Europe. I'm Catherine Nicholson. Thank you for being with us. Now, in this programme, I'm speaking to the President of the European Parliament's Security and Defence Subcommittee, former Europe Minister of France, Nathalie Loiseau. Uh, she went to Ukraine in late January with a delegation from the European Parliament. Thank you very much for being with us, Nathalie Loiseau. Good morning. I'd like to jump straight in with uh, some of the latest uh, big developments. Um, Overnight into the early hours of Friday, Russian forces attacked and then seized a nuclear power plant in Ukraine. There's great concern, of course, about the safety of this. Uh, do you believe that Vladimir Putin would actually allow a nuclear catastrophe? I don't know. Uh, but uh, once again, uh, Russia did something that is completely irresponsible. You don't shoot at a nuclear plant. There is a general agreement on this. And the uh, director general of IAEA, uh, Rafael Grossi, uh, proposed to uh, go himself to Chernobyl and meet with Russian and uh, Ukrainian uh, envoys so that there is an agreement to protect nuclear plants in, mm. in Ukraine. It is very irresponsible to, to take such risks. Ukraine is insisting once again that it wants a no-fly zone, saying really uh, this seizure of the power plant uh, proves the need for that. Uh, would this seizure make you think again, make France think again? Well, it's a question of, of NATO and European allies, uh, and we don't want to be part of the war. Uh, we are not at war uh, with Russia. We are helping uh, Ukrainians uh, who are under attack. But we are no co-belligerents. Uh, a no-fly zone would mean that we would enter uh, into the war uh, in uh, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And so far, it has not been a decision taken by NATO. Uh, uh, NATO is a defensive alliance. Uh, we don't wage wars. We protect our fellow citizens. Uh, Ukrainian and Russian government representatives uh, have themselves met uh, again uh, on, in Belarus for talks. Uh, Russia apparently agreeing to allowing humanitarian corridors to permit Ukrainian civilians to leave uh, the conflict zones. Uh, what do you make of this? Well, let, let's wait if it gets real. Uh, there have been a number of promises from the uh, Russian side uh, recently uh, to hold a ceasefire, uh, to, uh, not to shoot on civilians, and these promises were all broken. Uh, but I wish uh, that it comes true. Uh, uh, I see what's taking place in Kharkiv, for instance, and elsewhere in Ukraine, where civilian uh, districts are being uh, shelled uh, all day long. Mm. There are a number of civilian casualties. Hospitals are running short of uh, a number of things. Uh, there is a need for humanitarian corridors, and this is something that uh, Emmanuel Macron has been insisting about in his numerous phone calls with Vladimir Putin. Indeed, uh, the French president had a 90-minute phone call with Vladimir Putin uh, just on Thursday. Uh, Paris tells us that Vladimir Putin was talking about neutralization of Ukraine, uh, <coughs> and the Elysee office said that the worst is yet to come. What do you take that to mean? Well, obviously, uh, it's by a number of pretexts that uh, Vladimir Putin had taken before. He was talking about NATO, he was talking about Donbass. You know, he's obviously willing to invade the whole Ukrainian territory and take whatever it means to achieve it. And he's probably surprised to see that things don't go as fast as he had uh, foreseen. Uh, so he is not in a mood to stop war. Uh, this is the reason why uh, the European Union and other partners have taken very strong sanctions, which will uh, be implemented uh, in the next few hours and days, uh, in order for the uh, Russian president and the Russian people to understand that they have everything to lose and nothing to gain in waging a war in Ukraine. President uh, Macron has had several conversations with Vladimir Putin now, uh, and yet things have continued to get worse in Ukraine. Is it useful for the French president to keep having these conversations? Well, um, I hope uh, that uh, it, it brings results. Uh, Emmanuel Macron is, is very lucid about it. Uh, he knows that how difficult it is. Uh, it, it's not uh, rewarding to do what he's doing, uh, to keep on talking with the Russian president, but it's necessary. Mm -hmm. There has to be a voice. There has to be a channel. There has to be a way first uh, to express the views of uh, Western allies. 
And second, uh, at the very moment where Vladimir Putin will be ready uh, to stop war, uh, to work on it and to uh, walk the diplomatic path. So this is necessary. Now, in terms of uh, what's actually happening inside Ukraine, uh, we know several uh, human rights groups say they have evidence of war crimes. A delegation from the International Criminal Court uh, has gone to Ukraine to investigate. Do you believe that Russian troops are committing war crimes? Oh, it's not a question of belief. Uh, it's a question of uh, evidence and facts. But uh, obviously, uh, shooting on uh, schools, shooting on uh, hospitals uh, uh, amounts to uh, war crimes. And um, there is also a, a, a huge pressure within Russia. Uh, it seems that Vladimir Putin is also at war with his own people. He, uh, he's arresting uh, protesters who are against the war. He's closing uh, Russian media. Uh, he is preventing uh, Russians from leaving the country because they don't want to be uh, to, to 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 serve as soldiers in the war. Uh, it's not only Ukraine which suffers a lot, but it's also the Russian people, and it's a war of choice of one single man, Vladimir Putin. Um, in terms of uh, the attacks on civilians, deaths of civilians, there was a news conference on Thursday with Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister. He effectively acknowledged, to my sense, that his regime is killing civilians in Ukraine, saying any military actions are unfortunately connected to human loss, not just among military personnel, but among civilians. He then, though, seemed to argue that the West cannot complain about this because of well-known incidents of what's known as collateral damage, when, for example, the US-led uh, coalition was uh, waging war in Iraq, for example? Well, we have a series of lies coming from uh, both the Kremlin and from Sergei Lavrov. Uh, remember that they first said that they had no casualties in Russian troops, and finally they acknowledged that they had some. Uh, they had said that they were uh, sending troops, and they still say it, that they are send sending troops to liberate Ukraine from a new Nazi regime, which doesn't exist, and to protect uh, Russophones, Russian-speaking uh, Ukrainians. One of the uh, cities that is the, the most uh, hit by shellings from Russian troops is Kharkiv, the city in Ukraine where there is the uh, biggest amount of people speaking Russian. So all these are lies, uh, but step by step, even with censorship, and even with a lot of disinformation, uh, Russian authorities have to acknowledge that uh, they have casualties. They are killing civilians. Uh, they are doing exactly what they had said they wouldn't do. Uh, let's talk about the European sanctions on Russia, quite massive sanctions, unprecedented uh, ones, in fact. Uh, can you tell us, uh, do you see that the effect of those sanctions is playing out as you would have anticipated? Or do you think those sanctions... Uh, would you like to see them tightened, perhaps impact the energy sector? Well, not all sanctions are, are fully in place right now. Uh, for instance, uh, decoupling uh, the seven uh, Russian banks from the uh, SWIFT system it is going to happen in the coming days. But already the central bank already uh, uh, freezing of Russian assets in Europe uh, are creating uh, a debate among the elites in Russia, and this debate is necessary whether to, to this war uh, should continue or whether it should stop. Uh, the uh, closing of RT and Sputnik throughout Europe is also necessary because these are not media. These are weapons of propaganda and disinformation in the middle of a war. Uh, so I hope the sooner the better the sanctions can change minds in Russia and uh, can help stopping the war. We are not at war with the Russian people. We don't want the Russian people to suffer. We want the uh, Russian elite and the Russian president to realize that this war uh, is a high cost for them and that they should stop it. Uh, just in terms of whether sanctions could evolve, though, from the European side, uh, the European Union's foreign policy chief, Josep Borrell, said on Friday that all options remain on the table about new sanctions against Russia. Um, could that mean sanctioning oil, uh, oil and gas from Russia, which, of course, Europe is so dependent on? 
while Europe has to be less dependent on oil and gas from countries like Russia, uh, who are threatening us or are threatening the uh, peace and security. Uh, we are working on it. Uh, and Joseph Borrell is right in saying that we have not exhausted the list of sanctions that we can take. Uh, we can still uh, take additional sanctions. I will not list them because I don't want uh, mm -hmm. the Russian president to be prepared to go against these sanctions. But he has to be fully aware that we are determined. Just a word about very important uh, aspect of this humanitarian uh, refugees fleeing uh, Ukraine, as we know, uh, by the million. Uh, now, France is not one of the border countries where people are arriving. Uh, what role do you expect France to take, however? Well, uh, we are all working at the European level first to grant the uh, temporary protection mechanism, which was uh, never used before. And it was decided very rapidly a few days ago by the uh, European ministers of interior. Mm. Second, there is solidarity towards uh, uh, I would say frontline countries like Poland, like Romania, to help them welcome refugees. And third, we stand ready to take a part in welcoming refugees. I know a number of mayors, I know a number of uh, individuals or NGOs working to uh, welcome refugees. Uh, these people are uh, fleeing their country because they are European, because they feel uh, that they share our values. So we really have to open and make everything we can to support them. Nathalie Loiseau, that's all we have time for, but thank you very much for speaking to us on Talking Europe. Thank you. Thanks to you for watching. Do stay with us in part two of the programme, a debate at the European Parliament about the situation in Ukraine. That's in just a few minutes' time.